morning. We are so blessed to have you. Thank you for coming to Bible study this morning. Welcome to our online family. Thank you for joining us. We are blessed to have you this morning. We're going to finish up today on Psalm 22. Last week, we ended our study with verse 21. And we'll begin today with verse 22 of the glorious Psalm, chapter 22. And with verse 22, this psalm takes a dramatic turn in describing events. Jesus' agony and prayer that he's been praying through this psalm, 22, as he's hanging on the cross. His agony and his prayer turns into praise to his father. From verse 22 to the end of this psalm in verse 31, these verses describe the resurrection in such glorious word picture. So verses 1 through 21 describe the crucifixion scene. Verses 22 through 31 primarily describe the resurrection. So let's begin our study of, of Psalm 22, verses 22 through 31. Now, verse 22, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. Notice that word congregation, in the midst of the congregation. Now, if you take the Hebrew scriptures and translate them into Greek, which the Septuagint translation does, the Old Testament Septuagint scripture of verse 22 for this word congregation, it's the Greek word, if you look it up in Strong's, it's, it's number 1527, ecclesia, is, is, is the called out. It's the church, it's translated so many times in the New Testament, ecclesia, church. So the Greek translation of the Hebrew scripture in the Septuagint, this word congregation, is ecclesia, the church, the called out ones. Now, Jesus praying through this psalm as he's hanging on the cross, who is his brethren? I will declare thy name unto my brethren. Who's his brethren? The Jewish people. The Lord Jesus calls upon his brothers, the Jewish people, to join him in praise and worship to the Father. Jesus is addressing the assembly, the congregation, those who would be in the Jewish synagogue. So Psalms 22 is also speaking of a resurrection. A resurrection of who? This one whom the prior verses are referencing this one who is described as being lifted up, this one who was nailed to a cross, this one whose hands and feet were pierced, this one who's, who is thirsty, this one whose bones are out of joint, this one who says, I can look down and count all my bones, this one who says, they stare at me and they mock me. This one says I'm going to be able to then stand up and declare in the congregation that I am alive. I am resurrected from the dead. This verse clearly speaks of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. So think about it. Verse 22 of Psalm 22 does Prophet David penned these words a thousand years before Jesus hung on the cross. And then Jesus, as he's hanging on the cross, is praying through this psalm. And Jesus is quoting a scripture which hadn't been fulfilled yet. In Hebrews chapter 2, verse 12, the word says, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. This is an exact quote from verse 22 of Psalm 22 that we just read. Who could orchestrate this? No one except the Lord, the Lord himself. Now, look at this word church. It's ecclesia, number 15, 20, number 1577. In the 
the Greek concordance, ecclesia, church, same word. If you go to the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament scripture, in verse 22, congregation, or this word church in Hebrews 2, 12, same Greek word, ecclesia, the called out ones, the assembly, the church. Now, look at verse 23. Ye that fear the Lord, praise him. All ye seed or descendants of Jacob, glorify him and fear him, all ye the seed of Israel. Now the Lord Jesus is saying, everyone join in, everyone join in to praise and glorify the Father. Verse 24, for he hath not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, neither hath he hid his face from him, but when he cried unto him, he heard. Jesus is crying out to the Father, and the Father hears his cry. When did Jesus cry out to the Father? One place was in the Garden of Gethsemane. The other place here as he's praying through Psalm 22 as he's hanging on the cross. But before he went to the cross, he cried out to the Father in prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. In Hebrews chapter 5, verses 7 through 9, it says, Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplication, was strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death, and was heard in that he feared. In Luke 22, you can, you can read where Jesus was in the garden and he fell on his face and he prayed and he said, Father, if thou be willing, let this cup pass from me. And, and it says he was in agony, being in agony, his sweat became as it were great drops of blood. He was in such agony as he prayed and cried out to the Father. So Hebrews tells us, Hebrews 5 here, who in the days of his flesh, when Jesus walked on this earth in a flesh body, when he had offered up prayers and supplication with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death, Jesus prayed, if it be thy will, let this cup pass from me. And then he said, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done, Father. And verse 8 of Hebrews 5 says, Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Now, look at verse 25 of Psalm 22. My praise shall be of thee in the great congregation. Here's our word again, ecclesia, in the assembly, in the church, in the congregation, I will pay my vows before them that fear him. This goes back to the, the verse we just read, verse 22, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the congregation. See the two words, verse 22, congregation, verse 25, the great congregation. So, we see Jesus hanging on the cross and, and turning to the Father in praise and worship. And he says, all my people, my brethren, they're going to declare my name in the congregation, in the assembly. Now, you remember last week we began when we went through the verses to get we put it in outline form, and we got through 11 points of our outline. Well, this is point 12, verse 26. Verse 26, the meek shall eat and be satisfied. They shall praise the Lord that seek him. Your heart shall live forever. What is this in reference to? You remember the repentant thief hanging on the cross beside Jesus. He became meek. He became humble. In Luke chapter 23, verses 42 through 43, this repentant thief hanging on that cross, he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. What was Jesus' answer? Verse 43, Jesus said unto him, Verily or truly, I say unto thee, Today, this day, shalt thou be with me in paradise. So, 
Verse 22 of Psalm, verse 26 in Psalm 22 says, Your heart shall live forever. This sinner, this, this thief who was hanging on the cross, Jesus said, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Your heart is going to live forever. You're going to live forever with me. Now, the 13th point is verse 27. All the ends of the world shall remember and turn unto the Lord, and all the kindreds of the nation shall worship before thee. This is saying a time will come when a people will turn to the Lord, and they will worship the Lord, and they shall remember. What, are, what will they remember? They're going to remember that this what this one that hung on the cross did for them. They're going to remember. And that's what we do every time we, are, we come and partake of communion. What did Jesus say? As often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. And so verse 27 says, All the ends of the world shall remember. What are they going to remember? What this one hanging on the cross has accomplished for them. They're going to remember reading and learning and accepting that one, the Lord Jesus, as their Savior. This one who was crying out in verse 1, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? This one that is going to be pierced. This one that is going to thirst. This one whose bones are going to be out of joint. This one who's going to be stared at and mocked. This one whose clothes, whose garments are going to be gambled over. This one who will cry out to tell us that it is finished. Verse 27 says, all the ends of the earth world, they're going to remember and they're going to turn to the Lord. They're going to remember what the Lord Jesus did for them hanging on that cross. What the Lord Jesus accomplished for them through his death, burial, and resurrection. They're going to remember what the Lord Jesus did. And they're going to turn to him. They're going to accept him. And they're going to worship him. Verse 27. Oh, I love verse 27. Verse 28. For the kingdom is the Lord's, and he is the governor among the nations. After the suffering on the cross, then comes the glory and the worship of the Lord in the worldwide kingdom. The kingdom is the Lord. This is looking way ahead in time, not only to our day, but also even further down into the thousand year millennial reign of the Lord Jesus when that time comes. That's the beauty of the prophets writing prophetically. They are writing. David, as I have told you, penned these words a thousand years before Jesus hung on the cross. Yet it was as if the prophet David was standing at the foot of the cross looking up at Jesus and, and writing everything that he saw Jesus experiencing hanging on the cross a thousand years before it happened. And yet David, as that prophet, is looking further ahead to our day. When we will look upon him, we will read about him, we will hear sermons about him, and we will accept him as our Lord and Savior, and we will remember what his death, burial, resurrection accomplished for us. And then the, the psalmist David looked even further ahead, the kingdom of is the Lord's, the millennial kingdom, the thousand year millennial reign. Verse 29, all they that be fat, the King James says, it means prosperous upon the earth shall eat and worship. All they that go down to the dust shall bow before him and none can keep alive his soul. What's this say? What's going to happen to all of us if the Lord Jesus doesn't return? We're going to go by the way of the grave. We're going to go back to dust. This, this flesh body will be buried in the ground and go back to dust. And then all those who die, what will they what will happen? They'll be resurrected. They'll be raised up again. 
Why? To stand before the judgment seat of the Lord. Romans chapter 14 verses 10 through 11 says, For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. Oh, what a day that's going to be when we all are resurrected from the dust, from that grave, we stand before the judgment seat of Almighty God. Philippians chapter 2, verses 10 through 11 says that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Every knee, no one is going to escape standing before the judgment of the Lord. And every knee is going to bow. Every tongue is going to confess. Yes. They may not bow their knee to the Lord in this life. They may not accept the Lord as their Savior in this life. But when they stand before him, they will at that time, bow their knee, and they will have to confess that, yes, you are Lord. Even though I did not accept you, you are Lord. Psalm 22, verse 30, a seed shall serve him. It shall be accounted to the Lord for a generation. The righteous seed those who will serve him, not only in our day now, but also looking further ahead into the millennial kingdom, a seed, a remnant shall serve him, and it shall be accounted to the Lord for a generation. Now, the 14th point in our outline is verse 31. They shall come and, share de and shall declare his righteousness unto a people that shall be born, that he hath done this. We've talked about it before, that very last phrase of verse 31. He hath done this. Remember, if you translate the Hebrew scriptures into the Greek, you remember what this phrase is in the Greek Septuagint? It is tetelestai, one word in Greek, tetelestai, which translated in English is, it is finished. And we know that Jesus said those exact words hanging on the cross, John 19, 30. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, tetelestai, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost, the King James says. He, he bowed his head. He gave up his spirit. He died. Now, how does Psalm 22 end? With Jesus declaring that what he went through on the cross finished the work of redemption forever. This psalm ends declaring that the Lord Jesus' righteousness is for a people who shall be born. That's us, you and I, Jesus hanging on that cross to tell us that it is finished. My death, burial, resurrection is going to assure your opportunity to accept me as your Lord and Savior and be born again. He is declaring to tell us that it is finished to a people who shall be born, us and all those people who are yet to be born and yet to hear the gospel message and yet to accept the Lord as their Savior. We who will be born later, this verse, verse 31 is declaring, we who will be born 2,000 years later, we who will believe in the Lord Jesus. So this psalm is declaring unto us, to tell us that it is finished. Christ has finished the work of shedding his blood, dying for us to pay the price to redeem us from our sins. Hallelujah. It's so amazing to see in verse 1 of Psalm 22, Jesus quoted these words of, the, of the, this psalm 
during his crucifixion. Verse 1 of Psalm 22, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? We read several times during this series from Matthew chapter 27, verse 46. At about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, laba sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? So not only did Jesus quote verse 1 while he was hanging on that cross, not only is he quoting verse 1 during the time of his crucifixion, he prayed through this whole psalm while he was hanging on the cross, and he echoed the last words of this psalm at the moment of his death. To tell us that it is finished. Verse 31 in our English Bible says the very last phrase, he had done this. It is finished. So this psalm, Psalm 22, is the most complete, it's the most detailed prophetic look at the exact events of the cross, written a thousand years before Jesus hung on the cross, written in both hundreds of years, approximately 500 years before crucifixion was even invented. Crucifixion had not been invented yet when the prophet David penned these words. Crucifixion wasn't invented until approximately 500 years after the psalmist David lived. It was invented by the Romans. And so Jesus prayed through this psalm that was written a thousand years before he hung on the cross. Yet this psalm totally parallels Jesus' last sayings, his seven last sayings, which Bible scholars call his seven words. Verse 1 of Psalm 22, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Jesus spoke those exact words in Matthew 27, verse 46. Jesus' second word, taking them in order of the... Of, these verses in Psalm 22, verses 7 through 8, all ridicule me. And they say, oh, he trusted in the Lord. Let the Lord deliver him if he will have him. So what was Jesus' second word? What did Jesus do as he looked down at the religious leaders and those mocking him and ridiculing him? He prayed, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Luke 23, verse 34. The third saying, the third word of Jesus, uh, taking these verses in order, verses 9 through 10 of Psalm 22. Jesus praying through these verses, saying, you took me from the womb. You're my God from my mother's belly. Verses 9 through 14, we see Jesus looking down from the cross, John 19, verses 25 through 27, and Jesus saw his mother at the foot of the cross. Jesus said to his mother, woman, behold thy son, and he said to John, behold thy mother, John 19, 25 through 27. Jesus' fourth saying, his fourth word is in verse 15 of Psalm 22, where it's recorded, my tongue cleaves or sticks to my jaws. What was Jesus' fourth word? He said, I thirst, John 19, verse 28. The fifth word that Jesus spoke, his fifth saying on the cross, it is Psalm 22, verses 19 through 21. Don't be far from me. Oh, Lord, deliver me. Save me because you've heard me. Jesus is praying to the Father, and he's saying, you're the one I'm trusting in. You're my Father. You hear me. You will deliver me. And what was Jesus' fifth word? He said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Luke chapter 23, verses 45 through 46. And Jesus' sixth word hanging on that cross. Psalm 22, verse 26. The meek shall praise the Lord that seek him. Your heart shall live forever. 
Jesus 6 saying, hang on that cross. He said to the repentant thief, you will live forever. Your heart shall live forever. You will be with me today. Jesus said, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Luke 23, 42 through 43. And then Jesus' seventh saying, his last word on the cross, verse 31, the last phrase, he had done this. Remember, translated from Hebrew into Greek, it is to telestai, it is finished john chapter 19 through verse 30. so psalm 22 is the most clear it's the most detailed picture of the crucifixion that we have in scripture as i told you when i first started this series if we did not have the four gospel accounts of the death burial resurrection of the lord jesus if we didn't have all the other old testament prophecies concerning the death, burial, resurrection of the Lord. If we didn't have any of those scriptures, we could have this one chapter, Psalm 22, that gives us a complete picture of the crucifixion of the Lord. And But we don't. We have the entire Old Testament scriptures to read, to glean from, concerning the messianic prophecies of the Lord Jesus. So this psalm is part of a host of other scriptures like other prophets wrote, like the prophet Isaiah, like the prophet Daniel, who prophesied about the death of Messiah. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 8, the prophet Isaiah writes, He was cut off out of the land of the living, for the transgression of my people was he stricken. It's a messianic prophecy about the Lord Jesus being cut off, being killed, dying. Why? For the transgression, for the sin of my people was he stricken. In Daniel chapter 9 verse 26, the prophet Daniel writes about Messiah and he says, Messiah, he shall be cut off. Oh, but not for himself. Who was Messiah cut off for? Who did Messiah die for? You and for me and for every other person on the face of the earth and, and every other person that is yet to be born. The Messiah, he was cut off. He died, but not for his own sin. He was sinless. He died for our sins. All of these Old Testament prophecies remind us that the cross was not just the exact event which they prophesied that would happen thousands of years after these Old Testament prophets prophesied about it. But these Old Testament prophecies not only prophesied the exact event, but the exact place. And not only the exact event of the crucifixion, not only the exact place of the crucifixion, but the exact time. Our time from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. 9 a.m. when Jesus was nailed to that cross. 3 p.m. when he said to tell us that it is finished. And when he bowed his head and died. Jesus died in order to provide the forgiveness for our sins. Remember verse 6, Jesus said, I am a worm and no man. You remember that it's the Tola worm. Two words in Hebrew for the word worm. One is rima, which is, describes a maggot that consumes the dead flesh. And then Tola is the Hebrew word in verse 6 that Jesus used, I am a worm. Do you remember the total worm? It's the only worm that chooses when it's going to die. It's the only worm that chooses how it's going to die. It's the only worm that selects the exact tree that it is going to attach itself to, knowing that it will never leave that tree alive. And as that female worm lays her eggs underneath her body after she attaches herself to that tree, then the, as the eggs hatch, the larva eats the living body of the mother. As the, the mother die, is dying, she secretes that crimson dye 
which not only stains the bark of that tree, but stains the babies crimson red, dyes them red, and they, they remain that red color for their, their entire lives. That's what Jesus, hanging on that cross, accomplished for us. Not only did his blood stain the wood of that tree, not only did his blood stain that cross, but it covered us, stained us, dyed us red in his crimson blood, covering, redeeming us from our sins. Hallelujah. What does Isaiah chapter 1 verse 18 say? It says, Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, there's that word tola, crimson, scarlet, worm. Though our sins be as crimson, they shall be as wool. Just as that tola worm secreted that crimson red dye, covering the babies, dyeing them permanently with that red dye. And you remember, on the third day, that coloring fluid, that dye, leaves that crimson worm's body, and it turns white, and it becomes hardened. It becomes like wax. And you remember what that wax is used for? It's used in shellac. It's used as a preservative for wood. So Jesus is saying through the prophet Isaiah, Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, the total worm, they shall be as wool. Just as that total worm turns white, becomes like wax, which is used as a preservative to seal and protect that wood. What are we? We are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Jesus went to the cross, shed his blood, died for us, but three days later he arose from that grave. And then when we accepted him as Savior, what did he do? He sealed us with the Holy Spirit of promise. Just as that white wax is used as a seal, as a preservative to preserve that wood, Jesus gave us the seal of his precious Holy Spirit showing that we are his, we belong to him, and that he has given us his life. We are adopted into the family of God. How? We're sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. Romans chapter 8, verse 15, For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. What do we receive? Ye have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 through 5. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive what? The adoption of sons. Oh, in ancient times, in the Jewish culture, there was not a process of adoption, not among the Jewish people. If a man died in the Jewish culture, then his brother automatically became the head of that brother's household. You remember the Sadducees? They're sad, you see, because they don't believe in the resurrection. And so they came to tempt Jesus, and they said, Oh, Master, this woman had a husband, and he died. And so his brother married her, but he died. Went all through seven of them, and yet they didn't have any children. So in the resurrection, Jesus, whose husband is, is this woman going to be? And Jesus said, you do err not knowing the scriptures. In the resurrection, they'll neither marry nor be given in marriage. We don't have to worry about that in the resurrection. So in Jewish culture, adoption was not existent. The brother of the woman's husband became the head of her household, married her. So Paul, writing to the churches, when he writes of adoption, he's not writing 
through the Jewish lens. He's not writing to Jewish believers. He's writing to Gentile believers. This word adoption, which Paul writes in his epistles, is referring to a Roman adoption. When a child was born biologically in Bible days, New Testament Bible days, the parents had the option of disowning that child for various reasons. So a woman giving birth to a child in Bible days did not mean that that child was wanted or that child would remain in that family permanently. But this was not the case of a Roman adoption when a child was adopted. In a Roman adoption, it meant that the child was freely chosen by the adoptive parents and desired by them. Who are we? We are adopted into the family of God, freely chosen. We are desired. The Lord wanted us so much that he was willing to die on the cross for us. So this child that was adopted was chosen by the adoptive parents, desired, wanted by them. This child would be a permanent part of that adopted family. And parents could not disown a child once they had adopted that child. Now, the steps of a Roman adoption, which Paul writes about so frequently in his epistles, in his letters, it's so interesting to study about a Roman adoption. You could adopt someone at any age. It didn't matter how old you was. You could be adopted. Nikki could adopt me, even though I'm, I'm old enough to be her mama. Yet she could adopt me. So in a Roman adoption, you can be adopted at any age. And you would cease to have a past. Your past no longer existed. All your debts would be canceled instantly when you were adopted. You would no longer owe anyone anything. Boy, wouldn't that be wonderful? You'd no, no longer have a mortgage payment on your house, a car payment. Anything you owed any, anyone would be canceled the moment you was adopted. And an adopted child in Bible days, in Roman adoption, that child received a new identity. You would lose your old name and you would be given a brand new name. What happened to us yes. when Paul writes about we are adopted? The steps I'm going through of a Roman adoption is exactly what the Lord Jesus did for us. When you was adopted in a, a Roman adoption, you no longer go by your old name. You're given a brand new name. And you did not have to wait until your adopted father died to receive his inheritance. What do we do now? We have wills that say that our death, our daughter, our son gets the house or gets our jewelry or whatever. No, in a Roman adoption, if you was adopted, you You've got access to your adopted father's goods. Everything he owned became yours instantly. Romans chapter 8 verse 17. We are now heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Everything the Lord Jesus has is ours. Come on, because we've been adopted into the family of God. Romans chapter 8, verse 15, we read it a minute ago. We have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father, or Daddy, Daddy. We are fully desired. We are fully loved. And we have been adopted into the family of God. We've been given a new identity through our Lord Jesus. The Roman adoption, which Paul wrote about, is a picture of us, you and I, being adopted into the family of God because Jesus went to the tree, died on that tree of the old rugged cross. We became joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Everything that Jesus has is now ours. Everything God the Father has it belongs to Jesus. And we've been adopted. We're his adopted family. And our name has been changed. 
We're no longer called sinners, but now we're called saints. We are have been adopted into the body of Christ. Oh, and not only that, but we are the bride of Christ. Hallelujah. And when you and I accepted the Lord as our Savior, our past was canceled, wasn't it? We no longer have a past. What we was in the past, the sinner we used to be no longer exists. It's been covered by the blood of Jesus. And the debt that we owed, we owed a debt that we could not pay. Our sin debt. Jesus, our beloved Redeemer, he paid a debt that he did not owe. He paid our sin debt. And now we have been formally adopted into the body of Christ. We've been formally adopted into the family of God. Jesus canceled our sin debt by stamping paid in full by his crimson, scarlet, red blood. We read it in Isaiah 118. Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, like that crimson dye of the total worm, they shall be as wool. Just as that total worm secretes that crimson dye, dyeing its young red. And then three days later, that crimson dye leaves that, that total worm's body and it turns white like wax as a preservative to seal and protect wood. Jesus went to the cross, shed his blood, died for us, covered our sins with his blood. And oh, three days later, he arose from that that grave, victorious over hell, death, and the grave. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13, and chapter 4, verse 30 of Ephesians says that he gave us the seal of the Holy Spirit, which stamps us, showing us that we are his. We've been adopted into the family of God. Revelation chapter 7, verse 3 says, as sons of God, we are sealed with the seal of God unto the day of our redemption. We've been adopted through Jesus going to the cross, shedding his blood, dying for us. He died on that tree, that wooden tree, covering that tree with his crimson blood and covering us when we repent of our sins, covering us, dying us with his crimson red blood. He died on that tree in order to adopt us into his family. Oh, but then three days later after he died on that tree, he arose victorious. And when he came out of that tomb, he was dressed in white, giving us the assurance in Revelation 19, verses 7 through 9, that we will also be dressed in white in fine linen, clean and white. Why? Because Revelation 7, 14 tells us that our robes will be washed and made white. How? Through the blood of the Lamb, our precious Tola crimson worm. And when Jesus returns, and riding upon that white horse, according to Revelation chapter 19, verse 13, Jesus will be clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And not only will Jesus return riding that white horse, but we will return with him, and we will rule and reign on this earth with him. Why? Because we've been dyed with the crimson yes. blood Amen. of our total worm. We've been stained, dyed permanently. He marked us as his own, adopting us into the family of God. Can you give our beloved total crimson worm a shout? For dying on the cross, shedding his blood in order to redeem us from our sins, paying yes. the sin debt that we could not pay, and paying the sin debt that he did not owe. He paid our 
our sin debt, washed us in his blood, died us permanently that in his crimson red blood, and then washed us from our sins and made us white. Oh, hallelujah. And stamped, adopted, sealed. We are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Adopted in his family forever and forever and forever. And everybody said, Amen. 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 Amen